All right, so what we're going to do now, this is, we talked about mass number, right? Mass number is about how much it weighs. On the periodic table, if you look at the element box, okay, next to each symbol, there's a number at the bottom. This number, for example, Krypton's 83.80. So it looks like, sorry, looks like this. That 83.80 that you see on the periodic table is actually known as the average atomic mass. Now remember we talked about a mass spectrometer that told us how much each isotope weighs? What the average atomic mass is, is it's what the average mass of all the isotopes is, okay? And it takes into account how many of each type there are and how much each one weighs. So if, if you say you go fishing, okay? And you catch uh, 10 fish, okay? And you wanted to get the average weight. What would you do? Whoa, weigh all of them. And? Divide by 10, divide by 10 right? You just add it, divide by as many as you have. So that's actually how we report this 83.0. It's by weighing a bunch of atoms and then dividing by the number of atoms and getting its average mass. Now, we do it in a very different way. So this is what I'm going to show you how to do. This is known as the average atomic mass. Okay, calculation, sorry. It says 75.77% of the chlorine has a mass of 34.97 AMUs. Now, you'll notice that this 34.97 is actually a little lower than 35. Now, 35 is the protons plus neutrons. You would think that that would be 35, right? The reason it's this little bit different is because, you remember we talked about energy and, and, and matter being equivalent? It takes a lot of energy to keep the nucleus together, and that's why the mass is actually smaller. That mass goes into binding the nucleus together. It's that energy that we get when, like, you, a nuclear bomb goes off, right? The mass in a nuclear bomb is only, like, this big. And yet it will, you know, level an entire city. There's that much energy in unbinding the mass of the nucleus, okay? Okay, so anyways, side note. There's also chlorine-37. Now, chlorine-37, chlorine-35 have percentages of 24.23 and 27, or 75.77. If you wanted to know how much the average chlorine atom was, you would say, what if I had 100 atoms? Well, 24.23 would be this mass, right? And then 75.77 would be this mass. You'd add all that up together and then divide by 100. So that's actually the calculation that's done here, except what they did is instead of using these as the percents, they used them as the fractions. So to get the average mass of chlorine, Having said all that, you just multiply these two numbers together, add them together, and divide by 100. Or you do the fraction times the mass, fraction times the mass, and add them together. Okay? If, you, if you lay it out systematically, this is the other, I just want to write this out for you. You just go 75. 0.77% times 34.97 plus 24.23% times 36.97. And you add all that up, and when you're done, you just divide by 100. And that's the average mass, okay? They do it as percentages rather than counting a whole bunch of atoms all the time. It's percentage calculations. Okay, so those are the only naturally, two naturally, only naturally occurring isotopes of chlorine. That's how you do the calculation. What if there are three isotopes? If there are three isotopes, each one would have a mass, each one would have a percent. You just multiply them, add them together, 
and then divide by 100, or you can use the fraction like they showed here. Okay? So let's do one, different one. Oh, by the way, I just want to show you this. When you do this calculation, 35.45, see this on the periodic table here? That's where this number comes from. Yes. That's the average mass. You're smiling like I'm crazy. I just realized it. <laughs> oh. We were talking about it, and she was like, it's right there. And I was yeah. like, oh, yeah, well. it's, That's how you get that number. <laughs> It's the aha moment. So this is kind of a generalization. It doesn't matter how many isotopes there are. You do the same process. Multiply them out, add them together, divide by 100. So like, for example, we're not going to do this one. 10, there's 10 isotopes. If there's 10 isotopes, it's the mass of the first isotope times its percent, mass of the second isotope times its percent, mass of the third isotope times its repeated, right? And then divide by 100. Okay, let's do this one. Magnesium has three naturally occurring isotopes with masses of 23.99, 24.99, 25.98, and naturally occurring abundances of 78.99, 10.00, and 11.10%. So irritating it doesn't add up. But anyways, that's data. Calculate the average atomic mass of magnesium. <laughs> Real data doesn't always do that for you. That's yeah. The yeah, percentage measurements. Okay? Let's set it up. What are you going to do? Tell me what to do. Or do you want me to let you do it and I'll come by and stare at you? Yeah. Them by their yeah. Or you can just multiply the numbers you see and add them together and at the end divide by 100. So either way, uh, since I wrote it out like that over there, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show that method and on the slides the other method. Okay, so I can say 23.99 times 78.99. Percent, right? At, in fact, I'm just going to leave the percent off. Then I'm going to go plus 24.99 times what? 10.00. That's a nice one to do. Plus 25.98. times 11.10, add all that up, there's a myriad of places you can make a calculation mistake here, right? So what I tend to do when I do these problems is calculate each line, write it to the right, and then add them together, and that way I can spot my error, okay? Yeah, yeah, just just to avoid mistakes, mm -hmm. okay. or to help me catch mistakes mm -hmm. when I make them. So that's what I got for the first one. Is that what you guys get the first one? Yeah, twenty four point nine nine. Oh, why am I doing that? What is that? Two forty nine. <laughs> because I'm multiplying by 10.9. And then the next one, 25.98 times, oops, 25.98 times 11.1. .1. That becomes 288 288.378. The ugliest looking eights ever. That's okay. So I'm going to add all that together. So 1894. All right, where's the back key? Oh, I can't. I don't have back key on this one. Nice. 
seven plus two forty nine point nine plus two eighty eight point three seven eight. And I get two forty three three two four three three, sorry, point two four eight. Um, in terms of places, it's to this place here. That's where I know the last place. It's just track sig figs. And then what do I do? Divided by 100. If I'd used fractions over here, right, then I would just added it up because each one of those would have been divided by 100. So divide that by 100. And that equals 24.332. AMU's atomic mass unit. Now you can kind of check your work, right? That's for magnesium. It didn't come out exactly right, right? 24.3050. Eh, that's pretty close. I will tell you the truth though on the test, when you get this question on an exam, it's probably not going to be one of the ones you look up on the periodic table. It's going to be one that we made up, like in a different place in the universe. Because these isotopic abundances are different in different regions, all over the world and all over the universe. Really? Yeah, it depends on how the star blew up or something. Right, do you guys know how the universe gets formed? No? Right. Yes, um, separate. Are we going to have tables up then during the that table will be up, and you'll get one at your, that you can have at your desk, yeah. And at the exam, I will try to space you. It depends on how many people actually show for the exam. I'll try to space you out like every other seat. And then also, we'll probably have a little bit of lecture so I can get caught up. Right? That's what you want. I can ask this question. I know what the answer might be. Would you rather have it before or after if I lecture? So you want the lecture before? But is it it's about stuff that we don't need to know after the exam? But no. Yes, yeah, yeah, I'm not gonna lecture stuff on the exam yeah, on the day. That would be awesome. Yeah. Okay, now you need to know this for the exam. No. Exam first. Yeah. If, the exam first, and then if your heads are totally fried, I will record it. May not be the best recording, but at least if you fall asleep in class. No, I'm going to cut you off, because we, I'm not going to give you two hours. Do you want a two-hour exam? No, I'm just wondering, like, if we take the test first, or we have to wait for... You may have to wait a little bit for people to finish. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask how long we get to this exam. Probably going to give you, like, 75 minutes, an hour and 15. Yeah. Because you know what happens when I get more time to give an exam? The exam gets longer. Right, and so I always kind of feel like there's this trade-off between making an exam with more questions and tiring students out. Right, um, I used to when I first started teaching, would just every exam I wrote was three hours long or four hours long. I just said, "Oh, what the heck? I got all this time." You know what happens? There's a lot of crying involved. <laughs> then you learn, you're like, "Ah, oh, that's probably too much stuff." And then you're testing endurance instead of knowledge. But there were some fun questions on there. So I'm going to try to keep it around an hour and 15 minutes. That makes sense. Uh, how many questions on the test was the question? Um, I don't really know how to say it. Um, the practice test has 50 questions on it. But it's, it's all in multiple choice format, okay? The actual exam will have some written where you, like for example, on the elements, names and symbols, and atomic numbers and charges, I might just make some tables up and you fill them in, right? Well, I could count that as 10 of those is one question, right? I don't know how to say it, but some of them are fast, you know, like... So you could have like 50 that Yeah, or I'll probably try to have, yeah, like on the homework, there's those tables you fill in and how long they take to fill in, right? Yeah, that's not one question, although it, it's like question, it's just, it is one question, it's worth more points, right? So I don't know how to answer the question. It's going to be an hour's worth of work, is what I usually shoot for, and then 15 minutes of going over it. None for this one, yeah. But you'll get the equations for temperature conversions. 
Okay, because I told you you have to know how to do that. You'll get all the conversion factors. Um, Just the temperature conversion stuff. I said you should practice those things. It's just using Can equations. Give us the I'll give you the equations, yeah. Conversion factors, I'll give you. Specific heats, I'll give you. Constants, all that stuff, I'll give that to you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for the periodic table, the ones that you, elements that you gave us, we just need to know symbols and names. Or symbols and names. And that's it. That's, that's it. Part. And then everything else you should be able to read off the periodic table. Okay. So I might make a, like I like these questions that says, what's the common ion for all of these elements? And then I'll give them by name. So you have to find the symbol, and then you have to write the charge. Right? And that's just looking it up on the periodic table. Right? But that's one question, but it might have five parts to it. Will spelling, will there be a little bit of wiggle room for the spelling of? Except for fluorine. Except for fluorine? Yeah, because that's my pet peeve. How, How do you spell fluorine? Wait, stop putting vowels in. <laughs> fluorine. Fluorine, not flowering. There is no flower in your fluorine, or there's no fluorine in your flower. Yeah, yeah. Get the flu from Flory. Yeah, sorry, I had to bring that one up, but that is my pet peeve. So if I put fluorine on there, you better spell it right. <laughs> After all this, actually, when I usually people spell it right because I make a deal out of it, but right, they're like he's gonna have a spaz. <laughs> I'm good at it, though, at least, at having a spaz. Oh, yeah, where did I store all this junk? In here. Molecules and compounds, I believe that's it. There we go. I'm going to skip some of this. All right. So, uh, sugar and salt, it doesn't matter. First thing to get across, properties of a compound. Okay, so what's a compound? It's a substance made up of two or more elements. Okay. Properties of a compound are, in general, different from properties of the elements that make them. So this came up yesterday, actually. You know, you don't think of sodium as a metal. I didn't have time to do it still today, but we got to get some sodium in water. It's pretty awesome. Um, sodium chloride is what we call table salt. So NaCl. Let me write this down. It's good for you to start seeing these things. You'll know how that formula goes pretty soon without having me to tell you, but... That's the formula for sodium chloride. It's made up of sodium atoms and chlorine atoms. It looks like, you guys know what salt looks like, right? But sodium, the metal, looks like this. This is actually sodium metal. Conducts electricity, it's malleable, you can make thin sheets out of it. Oh, it's very reactive with water. And this is chlorine. It's a poisonous yellow gas, right? So those are very different. And when you bring the two together, and it would be fun to do it. Maybe I can get the tech to do it. You light it on fire, it burns just beautifully. It's very hot, though, very hot. Burns holes in glass. And then you get that, okay, sodium chloride. So the properties of elements are generally very different than the property, uh, properties of the compounds that they form and vice versa. Okay, another thing to think about in terms of uh, compounds, okay, um, very few elements occur pure in nature. Almost everything that you see is a compound, except for, uh, well, you don't see it, but the gases in the air tend to be pure elements, but they're mixed as a mixture. But almost everything else, like water is H2O, it's two elements that are put in a compound. Salt, sodium chloride, sugar is, uh, well, glucose is C6H12. O six uh, sucrose is C twelve H twenty two O six I think something like that. 
but it's a mixture of two different elements. It's a combination of different elements. The thing about compounds is, that's different than mixtures though, is that in compounds, elements in the compound are always in the same proportions. That is, they always combine the same way. So if you have, for example, water, okay, it's always eight grams of oxygen. But this is what we mean by proportions, is the ratio is always the same, is one gr to one gram of hydrogen. Now we understand, because of atomic theory, that that's because atoms are whole objects, and in chemical formulas, atoms always combine in whole number ratios. You can't have half a hydrogen atom in a compound. We just know this from a lot of experiments. So when you make a compound, it always has the same proportions. It turns out, <clears throat> this is water. If you do H2O2, okay, what is H2O2? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> what is it? That's what it is. Hydrogen peroxide. It's hydrogen peroxide. You know that stuff you put on your cuts and it bubbles? Right? The stuff the bubbles are actually oxygen. So if you want to make oxygen, that's a good way to make pure oxygen and burn stuff. It always comes down to pretty much the same thing for me. It, its proportion is 16 grams of oxygen for every gram. Oops, sorry, I left my 16 grams of oxygen for every one gram of hydrogen. Now, you can kind of see that in the formula because we know the formulas now. But before, they didn't know the formulas. The way they got the formulas is by looking at these proportions. The way we got the proportions goes back to Lavoisier and making those very careful mass measurements every time he did an experiment and was able to determine that these these compounds are always made up of elements in the same proportion. Now, he didn't actually come up with that. There's another guy named Proust. But that's what allowed them to do that. Okay. Okay. Any questions? Just We'll do some problems with this concept, too. I'm going to skip over this. So, Proust, turn of the 17th, 16th, 17th uh, centuries. Or 17th, 18th century, sorry. All right, yeah. 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 <laughs> always do that. Okay. He, he was the one who actually figured out that elements always combine in fixed proportions, so he made the law of constant composition. Now, remember, law doesn't explain anything. He just said, hey, this is the way it is. All samples of a given compound have the same proportion of their constituent elements. That means the ratios are always the same. So like I said, when you do water, right, it's always right, 8 to 1. Now we know if you have 18 grams of water, it turns out it's made up of 2, gra uh, two grams of hydrogen and 16 grams of oxygen. And I'll show you how we know that in a little bit, but that's the way it always is. True of any pure sample of water, no matter where you get it, you see it on Mars and you bring it home, it's still going to be the same. Okay? That's kind of reassuring. It kind of is. There's just some structure in all that. Hmm. Okay, sorry. I got thinking about going to Mars. So, <laughs> the book. You guys read that book? Huh? Ghost of Mars, that's what it was, the title? Yeah. No, but there's a bunch of good Mars books. Anyways, two samples of carbon monoxide obtained from different sources are decomposed into their constituent elements. One sample produces 4.3 grams of oxygen and 3.2 grams of carbon, and the other sample produces 7.5 grams of oxygen and 5.6 grams of carbon. Are these results consistent with the law of constant composition? So this would be like a multiple choice kind of question or a fill in the blank kind of question. How do you show that? Well, what did I say before? Constant composition means that ratio is always the same. So calculate the ratio. So you're going to look at the first one. Oh, and make sure you get like, like make sure it's oxygen to carbon, 
Uh, I always put the larger number on top. There is no reason why you have to do that. But for some reason, people are much better at comparing numbers that are bigger than one than numbers that are smaller than one, just the way our brains work. So you say 4.3, oops, 4.3 grams of oxygen to 3.2 grams of carbon. I'm going to whip out my handy dandy calculator. And it says 1.34. Now I've got two sig figs, so, but I'm, I'm not going to round it. I'm just going to make note of that. 1.34. Two sig figs would be here, so I'm not going to carry any more digits. I'm going to stop there. Now I've got to look at the other one, right? So in order to know it's constant composition, you've got to look at both. You can't just look at one and say, oh, yeah, it's constant. It's not, you don't know that yet. 7.5 divided by 5.6. Again, make sure... It's the, the grams of oxygen are in the same place for both, that you do it the same way for both. And always, if you can, put the bigger number on top, divided by what? 5.6 5 .6 grams of carbon. And I'm going to get my ratio, and I'm going to say 7.5 divided by 5.6, and I get 1.339. two sig figs. Now, people get hung up on this, right? They say, well, those two numbers aren't different. It's not constant composition. But to the sig figs, they're the same, okay? So the answer is the ratio of oxygen to carbon for both is the same. The samples show constant composition. I'm not test you to draw an arrow like this. Is it always 1.34? Yes. Yeah. It is. The ratio between oxygen and carbon is always that for carbon monoxide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and there's another way to do it, by the way. I'll show you in a second. Another way to do this. We could check to see if this data is legit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The, the ratio is the same, so it shows constant composition. I'm just going to say CC because I'm lazy. Now, if I say carbon monoxide, if I say carbon dioxide, what does that mean? Formula. You guys know it. CO2, right? It's because it's you know, like pellet guns and airsoft guns and... Soda machines and all that CO2. Carbon monoxide, what do you think that means? CO. CO. So if I have C and if I have O, right, <clears throat> there should be 15.9994 grams of oxygen for every 12.011 grams of carbon because that's how much each one weighs. And from the formula, I know it's one and one. So I could check, like, are these guys lying to me? Because, you know, like, a lot of times on tests, we fudge numbers so the numbers don't come out exactly like they do on the periodic table. Hmm. Shouldn't have told you that. 15.9. Now, now you'll never believe anything I say. Twelve point zero one one. So let's do that calculation real quick. They got way more sig figs than we do. All right, so I'm going to go fifteen point nine 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 four divided by twelve point zero one one. I get one point three three. Well, because I ran out of paper. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's 33206. Oh, right, right, right. right. Okay. But I just ran out of space yeah. over here, so it just goes like that. Anyways. But here's the deal. People will look at this and say, well, that's not the same as that, but it's close enough. And the sig figs that you have for this, it's exactly the same as that. Okay? So you would round up to the three? 
Um, I didn't just because I wanted to show you what all the digits were and how people get confused. Then when you report the value, it would be 1.3 and 1.3. This one, too, if you're comparing, I should have taken it out five sig figs, but I did, like I was telling you, when I ran out, I didn't want to keep writing over here because it doesn't extend that way. Oh, well, maybe it does. Does it extend that way? Oh, it does. What? My mind is blown. Okay, so let's talk a little about chemical formulas. Uh, some of this you know. If, if you know this part and it's boring, can you just take a nap? So, can, oh, sorry. I said if you know this part and it's boring to you. If you don't know this part it's boring to you, you still have to stay awake. So, when we write a chemical formula, there's an order in which we write the elements and there's a format, okay? So, let's start with this. It goes like this. Element symbol, subscripts tell us how much of each atom there is. It's the subscript immediately to the right. So that's why when I said, hey, you guys know what CO2 is, right? C, carbon, O2, two oxygens, okay? Here we have the symbol for oxygen, and if the subscript is one, we don't write it. It's called an implied subscript. Now, how come it's not OH2? Because there's rules for this stuff, okay? Um, here's the simple. I'll give you the simple. I'm going to show you the actual answer, okay, which I hate, but I'm going to show you the simple thing. Hey, the stuff on the left is usually first, <laughs> and the stuff on the right is usually second, and it kind of just goes that way. So it's H2O, it's BEO, it's SC2O3, but forget all the subscripts, stuff on the left comes before the stuff on the right. Okay? And it's actually based on metallic characteristic. It's usually the most metallic to the least metallic as you go to the top right, okay? There's actually more of an order to it than that, and we'll show you that too in a second. Okay, uh, table sugar, C12H22O11. I could have just looked there. I had to think about what it was, right? 12 carbons, 22 hydrogens, 11 oxygens. Okay. I'm going to skip this. We talked about it already. Now, about the order. All right, chemical formulas list the most metallic elements first. In compounds that do not include a metal, the more metal-like element is listed first. And remember, metallic character increases to the left and down, actually. With the exclusion of hydrogen? Yeah, hydrogen's an oddball because it... It shows up, it could show up on either end of the periodic table based on its chemistry. Because carbon came before the hydrogen in the last Yeah, yeah, so carbon is the oddball. I'll show you the order, too. There's an actual, like, official order for these things. Here's the order. Carbon, right. Honestly, you, you almost never need to know this, Okay. I just wanted to show you that it, there is a way that it's done, and if worse comes to worse, then you have to do it. I'm never going to test you on, hey, what comes before carbon? <laughs> You'll be like, there's nothing before, metals come before is carbon. Is there because of its role in organic chemistry, just how frequently carbon's used? Um, it's placed there based on its behavior in forming compounds. I think that's the simplest way to put it. Like whether... Um, it pulls electrons or gives electrons more. So if you were to write a formula, this is the order. Carbon first before phosphorus, phosphorus before nitrogen. Then hydrogen comes after all of those. So this is where hydrogen's weird. So if I said to you, I want you to write the formula for ammonia. This is one of those ones you should know, but I will just tell you right now. It's made of one nitrogen and three hydrogens, what would the formula be written? Well, there's two possibilities, right? It's going to be H3N or NH3 based on this order, the hydrogen second, okay? So this would be the correct way to do it. 
you will find in general for most of the stuff you see that hydrogen will come after these things. But for example, it comes before sulfur, right? So rotten egg smell, hydrogen sulfide, very potent odor. I used to make that at home too. <laughs> My mom was awesome. She still is awesome, but she can't get me illegal chemicals anymore. So it's not illegal, really. All right, just covering myself. Remember, I'm recording this. H2S. <laughs> H2S, that's to make stink bombs. That's how you make a good old-fashioned stink bomb. Sulfur egg smell. Um, back then, you could just buy all kinds of stuff in chemistry. So you get mercury. You get all, Yeah, I could get cyanide. I could get just all kinds of stuff. Now they have to worry about the psychopath that's going to buy 100 kits and kill half a country or something. Oh, my gosh. It's too bad. You know, when I was, uh, when I was like uh, probably seven, what I wrote I wanted for Christmas? Guess what I wanted for Christmas? I wanted a chemistry set. I'm like, what? My mom saved that. That's when they were cool. Yeah, my mom saved that, what I wrote when I was seven. And the other thing I wanted was a guitar. So I have both. I work in a chemistry department. I have a guitar. So I'm good. Not a guitar. Huh? Not a guitar. A Taylor? Okay. Uh, one of the... Acoustic? Yeah, 310. I guess it's a 310. It's an old series of 310s. All, yeah. It's a beautiful guitar. Anyways, write the chemical formula for each. It's up to you now. Go ahead and write it. Silver, two silver atoms for every sulfur atom. Now, remember, most metallic goes first. What's silver symbol? You got to know that. AG is one of the ones I told you you have to be memorized. So, AG. How many do I have? So two, where does the two go? Right behind the G. And then sulfur is S. Okay. Now be very careful about, like some people always like to write in caps or always write, like to write in lowercase. You have to be very careful when you write these. The first letter is a cap and the lower le second letter is lowercase. Okay. Compound containing two nitrogens to every oxygen atom. And I believe that's nitrous oxide. Yeah. N, what? Two. two. Oh. Um, yeah, that is nitrous oxide. You know what nitrous oxide is used for? It's laughing gas, right? Very popular uh, in the early 1600s. They used, to, they used to fill up sheep bladders with it. What about your cars? And inhale it. <laughs> What's that? So they use it for cars too? Yeah, nitrous, nitrous is used for, uh, as an oxygen source, uh, oxidant for fuels, because you can inject it and it burns really. How does it work? Like, what it do? I don't know. It just makes it burn faster. That's, I can't tell you really why. Okay. Oh, look, at, look it up. <laughs> you tell us later. The compound contains two iron atoms for, to every three oxygen atoms. So that, what's iron? Fe. Two, oh, three. Now I want to know. Dang it. All right, so now we also have something called uh, polyatomic ions. And these are like little gangs of atoms that just always go around together. Okay? So... A polyatomic, what does polyatomic sound like? Several. Several atoms. We also have monatomic, means one type of atom, okay? But polyatomic ions, right, are things like this guy here. This is the symbol for the NO3 minus group. That's known as nitrate. And then if you have a polyatomic ion, to indicate how, much, how many polyatomic ions there are, you have to use parentheses. Okay? 
And when you put the parentheses out here, you'll put a subscript on the parentheses to indicate that there are two nitrates. So when you have two nitrates and you wanted to know how many nitrogens there are, it's distribution rules like in math, right? There's a one here times two, that's two. There's a three here times two, that's six. So six oxygens and two nitrogens. Does that make sense? Like distribution, distributing numbers. Yeah. Yes, you'll be memorizing a list of polyatomic ions. Yeah, nitrate, sulfate, phosphate, or, uh, chlorate. Yeah, anyways, carbonate. There's a whole bunch of them. Yeah. It's coming. It's in this chapter. But let's just be happy for now. Okay. So determine the, the number of each type of atom in the following formula. That's potassium, known as potassium sulfate. Okay. So, I'll, how, so I'm going to make a list. There's going to be K, there's going to be S, and there's going to be O. How many Ks? Two. Two. How many S's? One. How many O's? Woohoo! A, L, S, and O. How many aluminums? Two. Two. How many S's? Three. Three. How many O's? Oh, well, okay. I guess you guys get this. We'll just move on. <laughs> okay. So when we represent molecules, there's different ways that we re represent compounds, I should say. And we can represent it as an empirical formula, and that's the ratios of the elements in a compound. So for example, oh, this is going to be cool. Uh, I don't know how much margin I have here. C, ah, oh, shoot. C. Oh, okay, I won't do it there. It's not much room. C6H12O6. Okay. That's a molecular formula. It tells you there's six carbons, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens. An empirical formula just tells you the ratio. So the ratio is one to two to one. It would just be ch 2O. 1 to 2 to 1 is the ratio. That's the empirical formula. That's often what we determine in an experiment first. And then later we figure out how much the whole thing weighs, and then we figure out the molecular formula from the total mass of the compound. So the empirical formula would be 6, is that 12? Yeah, 12. 6, 12, 6 is the Yeah, equation? that's the molecular. Okay. That's the at, 6, 12, 6 is the molecular. It's actually how many there are in the molecule that, of that Glucose, for How example. Would you write the empirical Just C H two O. It's this it's the smallest ratio. The way I got it is I looked to see what these were the largest number these were divisible by and just divided. Like What's that? Kind of like, kind of like reducing a fraction, but in chemical formulas. The, the most important thing that you do is represent it as whole numbers because if you say there's like a half of something, you can't have half an atom. So, you, so the smallest unit is the atom, so you try to keep that as a whole number. Now, there's lots of structural formulas, and I'm going to skip a lot of what this is right now because we're going to learn about it later. But I want you to know enough so that when you're looking in the book at the pictures to help you understand what's going on, you're going to have an idea of what that's supposed to represent, okay? Structural formulas, we use lines or spheres to show the actual shape of the molecule, okay? Um, so let me give you some example. Molecular is a type of structural formula. We call it ball and stick, okay? So every ball, you don't need to know this color code, but it's kind of cool to know. When you see a picture of a molecule, and it has colored, at, colored uh, spheres all over it, then what those colored spheres represent are different elements, and every element actually has a different color. Well, not every, but many of the elements have different colors. Hydrogen's usually white, carbon's usually black, nitrogen's blue, oxygen's red, uh, fluorine's green, bromine's brown. That makes sense, right? Bromine, brown. It's actually a brown gas, too, though, so that helps. Phosphorus is this color that I don't know what to call it. I know it when I see it, 
But I'm, you know, there's people that are colorblind, like four of my five boys are colorblind, but I, I'm not colorblind, I'm color stupid. And so when I, when I get to this color, I'm like, that's purple. <laughs> What's that? Green? It's not green, I know it's not blue, but it's something like that, yeah. Sulfur's yellow, though, and so is fluorine, All right? That's where I'm at. My colors, not good at art. Okay, molecular formula for methane is CH4. There's a bunch of different ways that we can show it, right? Here's a structural formula to show how it's connected. These are how the atoms connected. But then we show the shapes of the molecules. This is the ball and stick. This is actually to show how big the atoms are on the structure relative to each other, okay? But again, this is just methane. CH4 is a chemical formula, okay? It's also the molecular and the empirical formula because you can't reduce it at all. It's the, this is the structural form. The carbon's bonded to four hydrogens. This is actually how it's shaped. Now, if you look at this, this is supposed to be three-dimensional, okay? So if I was, if I was methane, which is that gas that comes out of swamps, okay, the bubbles that you can light it on fire, I would be like, there's a hydrogen on my foot, there's another hydrogen, right? And I would have to tip over like this. And these are hydrogens too. Mm -hmm. So if I stand like this, I can do it. It's easy. Uh, this is what hydrogen looks like. I've got two in this plane, and then I can't move my legs, but I've got two in this plane. <laughs> like this. The hydrogen is displaced furthest apart from each other, right? Yeah, and, and you notice how it's nice and evenly spread out? There is actually, there exactly evenly spaced out. And the whole goal for the molecule is to sort of most efficiently use the space around it because the atoms are surrounded by electrons and it likes to push those electrons around. Okay? Yeah, because they repel each other. All right, this is a good time for break, actually. So 10 minutes, we're halfway through. All right, so let's continue to talk about uh, compounds um, and how we represent them. So I just wanted to say, on, you know, there's macroscopic, there's atomic and molecular uh, views. So the macroscopic is like, you know, this is a glass of water. The way chemists actually see a glass of water, and this is hard to explain to people unless they've lived it for a while, we see it like this. We see just a whole bunch of molecules floating in there. We think about the space in between the molecules and how the molecules are like up against each other and attracted to each other or repulsed by things. So anyways, this is how in chemistry, when we start doing chemical reactions, you've got to start thinking about these particles that make up all of matter, which are atoms and molecules, okay? And that's the importance of knowing what these symbolic representations of molecules are is that helps us understand, oh, it's really like when I, make, when I make water from hydrogen and oxygen, it really does take two hydrogen molecules and an oxygen molecule. And they come together and things rearrange. I mean, just the way you see it is different and it helps you, okay? It's going to be hard. This is not something that develops in six weeks, unfortunately. It's something that develops over years, okay? But as you stay in the sciences and you study more, You'll get a better, better perspective of what's going on. So here's the molecular view of compounds and elements. Uh, this is a little bit more classification stuff. Um, this is going to be important, though, because when we get to this portion that's here, this is going to control how we name substances and how we put compounds formulas together. So you're going to learn how to predict what a formula is, and you're going to also learn how to write and name the formula, okay? We kind of know how to write it already, actually, because once you know how to predict it, you can write it. But we'll learn how to name it. And depending on whether or not it's ionic or molecular, okay, determines how we name it. Okay, so anyways, pure substances. Back on that chart of pure substances and mixtures, right? This is pure substances. This is elements. Elements are broken down into atomic and molecular. Now, the atomic elements are things like neon, but iron is, is known as a metallic element, but it is also atoms of iron next to each other, okay? 
turns out <clears throat> molecular means two or more of the same atom come together to form a molecule. That's its smallest unit. Um, I'll, let me hold off on, well, let me just give the brief description on this. Ionic compounds are made up of, what do you think? Ions. ions and ions come in two flavors, cations and anions. And generally, it's a metal and a nonmetal. Okay, so ionic compounds get named a certain way. You can usually spot them because they have metals and nonmetals in them. Okay, molecular compounds are made up of all nonmetals. So if you look at a compound and you see that all of it comes from this part of the periodic table, it's molecular. If one part comes from over here and the other part comes from here, it's ionic. Okay, that makes sense. And if it's just one kind of atom, it's an element. Okay? So O2, P4, S8. Right? Those are all one. I'm just saying one kind of atom. Right? Those are all elements. Okay. So atomic elements are the things that exist as atoms. And again, we said there's not many of those that, that you find uncombined in nature. And then there's molecular elements. And again, you don't find a lot of those uncombined in nature. But... There's a special class of molecular elements that we call the diatomics because they exist in nature as two atoms together. That's their most stable form. Now, there's lots of ways to remember it. But there's seven of them. What's the seventh element on the periodic table? Number seven is... Nitrogen. Make a seven. <laughs> How many atoms is that? Seven. No, it's actually six, which sucks. Uh, is it? Yeah. I just went from here to here. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh. The other one's hydrogen, and it's right here. And it turns out in the old periodic table, hydrogen. This used to work so great. It used to be right here. <laughs> right. So the seven diatomics make a seven on the periodic table, starting from seven, including hydrogen. <laughs> okay. Easy enough to remember. When you find them in nature, it's going to be something, too. Okay. So like in air, when you're breathing air in, you're breathing O2 and N2, because it's oxygen and nitrogen. And when I say nitrogen, you have to be careful what... When you, you got to listen or read very carefully, if I just say, hey, I'm breathing in nitrogen, I'm referring to N2. I could also refer to the nitrogen atom, right? So I'd have to say nitrogen atoms. But if I just say nitrogen, I'm talking about N2. If I say nitrogen atoms, I'm talking about one atom of nitrogen, okay? So does, does it exist in nature in the singular form? Yeah. So, in, no, no, in nature... It just it, they're all like this. This is their most stable form. By itself. Not usually, and if you do, it's usually bad. Okay. Yeah. So he's saying you won't actually find them this way. That's just well, uh, oxygen. Some of them you will, and the ones that you do find are generally hydrogen. Uh, well, nitrogen and oxygen, but hydrogen's usually combined with water. Fluorine and chlorine and bromine and iodine usually reacted with other things. Mm -hmm. But if you isolate them and try to get them in their pure form. They're always going to be these diatomic forms. I see. And with the other ones, you'll find them as atoms. Single atoms. Yeah, single atoms. Except for the few oddballs, like I said, phosphorus is P4 as an element, mm -hmm. and sulfur is S8. It makes an octagon. What's where do you commonly see octagon? Stop signs. Driving stop signs. Yes, it's shaped like a stop sign, but it's all folded up, you know, like the stop sign that you hit. <laughs> Is that what you guys were saying? <laughs> Run into a stop? No, sorry. No, it's in the UFC. What's that? UFC. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, so chlorine, this is a molecular. Mercury is an atomic, but you can't tell that. But, uh, you know, some individual atoms not bonded together. Again, the symbolic view helps you. If you can imagine... Individual mercury atoms laying side by side. Okay, 
So ionic compounds. Um, oh, yeah, so this is another way if you want to remember, if you don't like remembering the seven, starting at seven, including hydrogen, horses need oats for clear brown eyes or Hofbrinkle. There's like all kinds of, you look up how to memorize the seven diatomics, you'll find more ways than you can memorize. So it's kind of awkward. So I just remember the seven starting at seven. This is, you know, one of those other things that people like to do. All right. So uh, molecular compounds, two or more nonmetals. We already sort of talked about this, kind of came up. Ionic compounds, metal with a nonmetal. Cations, positives with negatives. And what's true about matter? All matter is electrically neutral. So you have to have as many positive charges in the ionic compound as you do negative charges, okay? That's an important concept. Okay. Okay, so the, the basic unit of an ionic compound is what we call a formula unit. The basic <laughs> unit of a molecular compound is a molecule, okay? So there's, they sound like they should be the same thing, but a formula unit is very much like an empirical formula. It's the smallest whole number representation of a substance. So when I say sodium chloride, right, you can often you know, think about these kinds of things. It's just NaCl. That's the smallest unit that I can find, one sodium, one chlorine. When I say um, something I haven't done, barium sulfate, it's Ba and then SO4. This is actually, sulfate's a polyatomic, but it's one barium and one sulfate. But if I say for a molecular compound, um, hydrogen peroxide, it's H2O2. It's not a simplest unit. Right? That's the molecular formula. So ionic compounds are always by the most reduced, usually reduced unit, and these are just whatever is in the molecule. And they can be essentially the same, or they can be different as proportions. Okay, now. So let's classify these. Um, atomic element, molecular element, molecular compound, or ionic compound. So chlorine, what is it? It's an element, and it's molecular, right? So it's an ME. Yeah, so it's one of the seven, right? You take the seven, you just look at the periodic table. Chlorine is a molecular element. NO. What is NO? Your choice. It's a compound, right? Now, if you look to see where N and O are, where are N and O? They're next to each other, right? Two nonmetals, it's molecular. Gold. What do you think? It's an element, and it's atomic because there's just one thing there. What did I say? A O A E. Sorry. N A two O. Where's N A? It's way over there, right? And then O is over here, so I have a metal. All right, with a non-metal, so it's an ionic compound. And then CrCl3, chromium-3 chloride is what it's called. CrCl3, where Cr? Where? Find it. It's a metal. Right over here. It's a metal, right? Cl3 is a non-metal. So it's ionic. it's ionic. And if you try to pronounce what I just wrote, it's mimo i ik. <laughs> Sorry. That's the no filter part. Um, yeah, and so what did I look at for this, right? For the chlorine, it's a single el single element. Gold, single element. So then I just had to remember these are my 
elements, right? I had to look to see, is that one of the seven? And if it is, it's molecular. Is that one of the seven? If it isn't, it's just atomic, okay? Okay. We're com the second one only um, molecular, not, it's not molecular compound, it's just molecular. Oh, sorry, it should be an MC, huh? I was just confused. My bad. It's me being lazy. Okay, any questions? This is important because if you can do this, that helps you to do the naming. Okay? The naming, how you name it, depends on what it is. Okay, so we're going to work on naming uh, or writing formulas of compounds uh, from names and from ions. So, there are ions with predictable charges. I already said this was the other day. So what you did in four is the foundation for chapter five. Metals in group 1A, 2A, and 3A. So what are those? Well, unfortunately, this periodic table doesn't do it very well. Here's 1A, 2A, and 3A. These are all predictable or fixed. That's what we called them yesterday, the fixed charged elements. This is plus what? One. This is plus, and that's plus three. And including, okay, zinc, silver, and cadmium. So I always like to think of a triangle here in zinc, silver, and cadmium. These guys make the fixed charge. If you want to include TL, uh, tellurium, um, or thallium, <coughs> sorry, it makes like a little flag on the ship, okay, oh, it's kind of a thing to look at. <clears throat> um, there's a couple that are missing from here, but for sure those uh, you should know. Uh, ionic compounds always contain the, uh, sorry, contain positive and negative ions, okay, and this is like the important part of writing the formula, the sum of the positive charges equals the sum of the negative charges, okay? So that's going to dictate the formula, how you write the formula. Okay, I'm going to skip this part. We're going to do this part. I'm going to talk through it. So the rules I just skipped of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to write a formula that forms the compound from strontium and chlorine, okay? So strontium is SR, and chlorine is Cl. Now, we've got to go to the periodic table, and we got to, from the periodic table, figure out what ions these things are going to make. Okay, now, strontium here is what? Plus 2. Chlorine is here minus one. Wait, why is that a minus one? Why is chlorine a minus one? Because uh, it's one away from argon. Remember that? To oh, do so, so if you start here, the charges are minus one, minus two, minus three. So those are zero then, charges. And then these never take a charge of zero. That, that's right. Okay. Right. Thank and you. and if you think about this too, this is kind of the mind bender. Right. This side of the periodic table actually wraps around to this side of the periodic table because the numbers go up. A lot of people make a periodic table a cylinder, right? With a periodic table on the outside, you make it wrap around like this, and they're actually all continuous all the way around. Okay. Maybe we should make some of those. But, but <laughs> it's a craft, right? We could have craft day. You could play guitar. He does. He plays. Never mind. You can play guitar and we can do crafts. That sounds awesome. So anyways, this side wraps around to that side. Yeah, make one on your own time. Getting all crabby now. It's past my bedtime, past nap time. Okay, so I want to write the formula that comes from this. Okay? So I have to make sure that I have just as many positives as I have negatives. I have two positives here. I have one negative here. How do I form the compound? I need two chlorines. So if I do Cl and Cl like this, just conceptually, right? 
there's minus 1 and a minus 1, so it's minus 2 total, and plus 2. So I can bring these two together to make SRCL2. The what? Okay, so what happened to this, right? It got canceled by the two negatives. How many CLs do you need to make that cancel? Oh, okay. Yeah, so. You write it on the top, but yeah, so yeah, you don't write it on top. The charges are still there. You don't. We don't write them because they balance each other out. And then you take care of that two by the two of these to cancel that plus two. Okay. There's kind of a simple observation to make here. You notice this number here showed up down there, right. and the number that's here showed up down here. It's called cross multiplication. <laughs> Right? You just cross multiply and then you simplify if you can. And you get the formula every time. Sure. Yeah. The only time, there's only one exception, and we'll get to it when we get to it. Okay. This has to do with the bonding of electrons, basically. It, you, yeah. Just, remember when, I said, when we talked about, hey, metals, they like to give up electrons. Nonmetals like to take electrons. Well, when they make a compound, they like to have balanced charge. So you have to have enough electrons to give and enough electrons to take. Otherwise, it's yeah. Otherwise, it ends up being an ion, and it usually picks something else up. Yeah. Yep. Makes it more stable. Okay. Let's do this one. Aluminum and nitrogen. What's aluminum? I mean, not what is it? Where's aluminum? Yeah, it's a plus three. Where's nitrogen? What's its charge? Minus three. Minus one, two, and three. Now, how many aluminums do I need for how many nitrogens? One of each. So you can write it like this. Then I'll show you how that other, oh, sorry. This, you can write it like that. Or if you like the idea of crossing over, Right? You would have three aluminums and three nitrogens, but the threes cancel then, so you, go to, you, you would divide that out, so it works out. So just make sure you do that every time when you use what's called the crossing rule. There are all kinds of names for it. It's crossing. Okay. Oh, there's these things called polyatomic ions. Oh, my gosh. There's a lot of them. So let me make a list for you from this list of the ones you need to know. their names, formulas, and charges, okay? And then I'm going to teach you how to figure out the rest from the ones you memorize, okay? And then I'm going to do this really cool thing. I'm going to show you how this all comes out of the periodic table. So it's a lot less memorization than you think. Okay. Wow, that's small. I don't think you can see that, huh? I will write it over here on the side because it'll just be easier. Acetate. Okay, so where you're gonna, where you guys are maybe familiar with acetate, or with men, is acetic acid, which is vinegar. Okay. So it's, it, it makes part of vinegar. vinegar. It's C2H3O2 uh, minus. Now, um, it has a minus one charge, and this is its formula. Now, it's a polyatomic ion, and so it all comes together as a package. Okay. And when it goes in a formula, you just keep, you put it together with whatever it goes with as a, as a combined like unit. Okay. You'll learn like what these structures are. But this is one of the ones you have to memorize. One of the other ones you have to memorize is carbonate. That's CO3 2 minus. Uh, you're familiar with carbonate because it's in limestone. Uh, you're also familiar with carbonate because it's in soda. Same stuff. 
carbonic acid. Now, hydroxide. So these are, I'm, I'm, the, I'm naming uh, some of the oddball ones first, really, but that's okay. Hydroxide. It's OH minus. So literally, this is actually an O and an H bonded together with a negative charge that floats around. This is, um, this is the principal component of things like lye. Lye is like, like drain cleaner. Right? Stuff you pour down your drain. Uh, if you form it with hydrogen ions, H plus, and then it makes water. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a very standard, like classic reaction. So, um, okay, so here we go. Nitrate. That's NO3 minus phosphate. Oops, lost my. Yeah. That's PO33 minus sulfate. That's SO42 minus. You know, it's pretty random, I know. You see on the periodic table, I have to go over there. Chlorate. That's going to be. Uh, ClO3 minus. Uh, make sure I'm not missing anything. I got carbonate, I've got nitrate, I got sulfate, I've got chlorate. Um, the only other weirdos are these ones that are down here. There's ammonium. That's NH4 plus. <laughs> And you should know peroxide, which is O2, 2 minus. Like in hydrogen peroxide, that's what that's from. And just because you should know cyanide, you should know cyanide, uh -huh. cyanide. That's CN minus. You see cyanide a lot uh, used in metal manufacturing processes. It's used to help deposit uh, Smooth layers of like uh, chrome, chrome plating, chrome plating vats. Didn't Hitler take a cyanide pill? Yeah. Oh, it's bad for you. <laughs> it's so bad for you. Yeah, CN. Yeah, CN minus. So let me show you the pattern, okay, for a lot of these. I am going. You know, I should record this. I'm going to draw the pattern, and then you'll be able to go to that spot in the, the notes. It is still recording, so while I wrote all that. Okay, so um, I'm going to draw a periodic table. But I know I have to be really careful about how I do this. <laughs> Man, I'm just trying to think of how to draw something <laughs> that I can be innocent about. Oh my gosh, you're so <laughs> well, you know, it helps keep us awake. Did anybody else see that, or was I just like the only one? You were the only one. <laughs> <laughs> right? We not, no, I didn't see anything. I have the slightest idea what she's talking about. That's the beauty of being bad at art. You can just say, well, I'm not very good at this. <laughs> okay, so this must be a periodic table, okay? So I'm gonna put I'm gonna put bits and pieces of the I'm gonna put fluorine in here. I'm gonna put chlorine in here. I'm gonna, you guys tell me put bromine in here. I'm sure some of you have already sent it to your friends. Look what my professor drew on the board. Oh, Okay, and I'm going to add some in here. You don't need to know these bottom two, but I'm just going to fill out my periodic table. And then I'm going to put, oh, I need one more for carbon. So you notice that's the corner of the periodic table excluding the Nobel gases, right? Okay, so um, now I'm going to fill in at the top what charge you expect. So for fluorine, you'd expect what? 
minus 1. Oxygen, minus 2. Nitrogen, minus 3. And carbon, minus 4. So that's just kind of how that goes, okay? Now I'm going to fill in the formulas for the polyatomic ions. Now, for um, oxygen, I'm not going to fill in uh, uh, peroxide. I'm just going to leave oxygen fluorine blank. So chlorine, CLO3. What's the charge of chlorate? I said it earlier. It's up over the... Where'd it go? Um, minus, one. minus 1. Okay, so this is one of the ones you're going to learn just by memorization or memorization of a pattern bromate is the same formula and iodate is the same formula okay now carbonate is what it's co3 what Two minus, and nitrate is NO3 minus. Oh, yeah, it's up there, nitrate. So look, look at these guys here. What do you notice about their formulas that are the same? The ones I put a little highlight line on. I didn't want to make it too bright. What are they? What do you see? They're all negative. They're all O3. So if you look at the periodic table, these are the ones that are all O3. Okay? Now the charge of all of these is minus 1. Nitrogen's a weird one, so it's minus 1, and then it goes to minus 2 here. So now I'm going to fill in sulfate, phosphate, and then arsenate and selenate. You don't need to know, but you're going to know them once I do this, so it doesn't really matter. Sulfate's what? Two minus. What do you think selenate is? Same thing. Same thing. Remember we talked about families? Yeah, it's selenium. Selenium is a big problem, by the way. It comes out of the, the oil shales on the west side. And uh, where else do they have? Maybe they have some on the east side of the Sierras. But anyways, it comes out. It's toxic. You need a little bit of it, uh, but you need micrograms of it, not what we're getting. Now, phosphate. What's phosphate? Oh, so this is four, sorry. Foss I, I did it wrong. Look at that. Good thing I said that. It's four. Fix it. It's PO4. Three minus. What do you think arsenate is? Arsenates are bad too because they're from ars they arsenic's poisonous. It's the same. Families, ASO4. Now, here's going to make my little highlighter here. That's not so light, not so high, but that's okay. What do you notice about those four? All have four oxygens. And look what happens to the charge. Minus one, minus two, and minus three. So if you can figure out, and you just, when, you, when you're doing these problems... Right. If you can train yourself not to immediately look for the formula, but say, where is it on the periodic table? What's its charge? How many oxygens? You're going to be so much better off by doing it from the periodic table than you will be just by trying to straight memorize it. Okay? And all of these end in A-T-E. So CO3 is, C is carbon, right? So it's carbonate. If it's nitrogen, it's nitrate, if it's phosphorus, it's phosphate, sulfate, chlorate, bromate, iodate. So this is, I always call this the table of eights. And then I'm going to tell you this evil thing. There's also a bunch of ites. <laughs> The ites, yep, 
one less oxygen. And when you subtract an oxygen from every one of these formulas, you get all the ites. So if you can memorize the eights, the pattern, then you know all the ites. The only oddballs that aren't on there on this list are acetate, right? Hydroxide, ammonium, peroxide, and cyanide. So those are the weird weirdos that they don't fit the pattern. They're not on that table, okay? The rest you can do by pattern. So what if I said, oh, chlorite? What is chlorite? Well, what's chlorate? Oh, yeah, so it's CLO3 for chlorate, so it's ClO2 for chlorite, and the charge is the same. So if I do chlor Ite, it's ClO2 minus. Oh, yeah, two minus, yeah. Sorry, I suddenly thought I wrote something else, and I'm like, what? What about phosphite? Yeah. What's the charge? Three minus the same, okay? Turns out phosphite's not stable like that, so it never really exists, but we can write the formula for it, and it's actually in compounds as part of polyatomic ion, um, but you never actually find it like that, but still side note. Okay, uh, I think we're good there. Can you, can you, you can go from hypo and hyper from the same list, right? Yeah, so that's why I'm going to try to, I can't quite fit it all on here, so I have to, I have to do this magic and copy So you guys can just um, start a new page. Yeah, so I cheated. I just copied the part I needed. Okay. Uh, I copied maybe more than I wanted to, but it didn't quite work out. I'm just going to work from here. So um, this is ClO3 minus, and then I have ClO2 minus. Right, so that's chlorate and chlorite. So let me write that out. I left my L out. Now, it turns out you can. Right. Oh, man. I need a nap. Chlor. Right. There we go. I should have zoomed in more, too, when I did it. It turns out um, there are two that others that form from this, and one is ClO minus, and one is ClO4 minus. Okay, so uh, you go up in the, you go swimming and you stay in the cold water too long, what do you get? Hypo. Thermia, right? Guess what this is called, not hypothermia. Hypochlorite. Below chlorite, right? Below chlorite. Now, unfortunately, uh, you would think it would be hyperchlorite for the top one, but they just said per. So this is per and then chlorate. Hype. Yeah, they just say per. Yeah. It's above chlorate. Yeah. It's the extra oxygen. Yeah. All right. So let's re write the formula that forms between compounds, uh, the comp formula for the compound that forms between calcium and nitrate. And you're going to find out chemists love nitrates. We use them all the time. Unfortunately, that's why our groundwater is horrible, but that's okay. 
It's nitrates in your drinking water that are bad for you that cause all kinds of horrible things. Okay, so I'm going to do calcium and nitrate. So what's the formula for calcium ion? Ca2 plus. And what's the formula for nitrate? Yep, NO3 minus. And you kind of got that. You knew the NO3 for sure because it's in this outside ring, or you write it from the board. And, and you know it's a minus one because it's the first one in that, like, it's the polyatomic ion. But it's a little hard to remember the charge of nitrate, but once you get used to it, it's not so bad. Now, I have Ca2 plus and NO3 minus, right? So that's going to be how many calciums and how many nitrates? Two nitrates and one calcium, right? So I can say Ca, and then I have to use parentheses, NO32, to indicate there are two nitrates in there. Let's do this one. Let's write the formula that forms between aluminum and phosphate. So what's aluminum ion? Yeah, Al plus 3 because it's in the group 3A. So I'm going to say Al3 plus. What's phosphate? PO3 minus 2. PO. Well, th maybe that's the one I wrote down wrong first. That's my oh, fault. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I just wanted to make sure you fixed it. So it's PO4, 3 minus. Again, you can get that because phosphorus is usually minus 3. You get that it's 4 because it's that one of those 4 in the middle. Yeah. So what's the formula? How many aluminums and how many phosphates? Three and three or one and one, right? So I'm going to write out aluminum phosphate. It's like that dog food, Alpo. Right. Okay. Now we're going to do sodium and sulfite. Okay. Itonate means it has oxygen with it. So sulfite is what? Sulfate is S-O. Let's start with sulfate. So S-O-4-2 minus. So sulfite is S-O-3. Two minus. So now I'm going to make it with sodium ion. What's sodium's charge? One. Yeah, oops, that was not very slick there. So how many sodiums, how many sulfites? Two sodium, Two sodium one sulfite. Like that. Well, I'm at this weird, awkward place in a break. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to stop here because I get like 10 minutes left, but it's not enough to really start and get going. So this is where we're going to pick up with lecture on Monday after we do the exam or before. What, what did you want to do again? You want exam first and then lecture and a nap, right? Good. And homework for four over in there if you finished it? Three for sure. And then um, for chapter five, it'll be due Tuesday because I'm going to finish the lecture on Monday.